On the agenda today, we have um, a review for exam number three, chapter seven and eight. And I'm going to share the document that we're working from. This is the same review document that you were given in class. And um, uh, I have some selections highlighted. So let me share. And we'll take it. There it is. Come on. There we go. Now we're sharing. Okay. Let me get my image out of the way. And we're ready to go. All right. This is yeah, that's the right one. Chapter seven and eight. This exam will be next week on the no. Next week is spring break. The seventh. Um, is the Friday of spring break. All next week, I assume, is is off at, at uh, Southern uh, for spring break. So we won't meet next Friday. Um, so we'll have this exam the week after on the 14th, April 14th. Okay, so let's get rolling here. Number one, in which of the following groupings are the three terms closely related? If you look at the selections that are available, you'll see that this, this question is derived from our discussion of uh, kinetic versus potential energy. Kinetic being disruptive forces, potential en energy being adhesive forces uh, cohesive versus excuse me yes cohesive versus uh, disruptive forces so which ones match well let's see what do we have to, to deal with we have selections we have uh, kinetic energy is one of them we have uh, energy of motion <laughs> right <laughs> that's the same thing as kinetic energy just to Check, see if you know what you're doing. Cohesive forces. There should be potential energy in there too. Yes, potential. Potential energy. Electrostatic interactions. Electrostatics. Okay. All right. The, strictly speaking, Electrostatics can be uh, attractive or repulsive. So we have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, so how about the first one? Kinetic energy, energy of motion, and cohesive, right? The one that doesn't fit is cohesive. So A doesn't work. How about B? Potential energy, energy of tra attraction, okay. Disruptive forces. Disruptive doesn't fit with those first two. How about C? Kinetic energy, okay. Electrostatic interactions, which uh, I'm taking the authors here want electrostatics to be attractive forces. And um, actually, electrostatics are, They're more closely akin to potential energy, which we are considering as cohesive forces. So disruptive and kinetic for C, electrostatic doesn't fit quite the way it should. That's potential energy. So we're gonna have to count C out also. How about D, potential energy, cohesive forces, those two fit. Electrostatic interactions uh, can fit in there as potential energy. So. Remember what I've always said about uh, multiple choice questions. You may not think that there's a right one in there, but if there, there are no selections that say none of the above or two of the above or any of those oddballs, then pick the best one. If you only have A, B, C, D to choose from, I'd pick D. 
That's the best answer of them all. All right, I spent a lot of time on that one. So let's move on to number two. All right. The phrase is particles close together and held in fixed positions and completely fills the container apply respectively to what? We've got phases here. We're referring to the phase of matter. So which phase where the particles are close together and in fixed positions? That's a solid. Right? So the first one is a solid. How about the second one? Completely fills the container. Which phase will expand to fill any container you put it in? That has to be a gas. Right? So the only one that fits that is B, solids and gases. All right. Let's scroll to number three. And no, we can't get four in there, so we'll we'll do four in a second. How many times larger in size is the atmospheric pressure unit than millimeters of mercury pressure unit? How many times larger? What we're saying is, what's the conversion factor? So 760 millimeters of mercury equals what? One atmosphere. That means that the atmosphere, one unit of atmosphere is equal to 760 units of millimeters of mercury. So the atmosphere must be a larger number. Uh, I said this before and I'll say it again. When you're going from a uh, large number to small number, then the unit goes from small to large. They go just the opposite. So if this one's getting a bit smaller from here to here, this one's getting bigger from here to here. So the size, the atmosphere pressure unit is 760 times bigger than the millimeter of mercury unit. So that's, that's C. All right, I would go down to four. Indicate what the missing words are in the following statement. All right, Charles Law. So what, scratch your brain a minute. What is Charles Law? Charles Law says that um, volume and temperature are related. Right. So as the temperature increases, the volume increases. Remember, if the quotient of variables is equal to a constant, they have to be directly proportional. If one goes up, the other one has to go up. So now let's take that at constant pressure. Oh, by the way, the other two factors that describe a gas are what? Pressure and moles. So if we're going to let these two vary, those two must be constant. At constant pressure, the volume of a gas sample is what? Proportional to its Celsius temperature or Kelvin temperature, excuse me, Kelvin temperature. This has to be in Kelvin. So the volume of a gas is directly proportional to its Kelvin temperature. That's B. All right, about, let's see, we can squeeze five and six in there. How about five? The correct form of an equation for the ideal gas law is, normally what we say, the ideal gas law, 
is written like this, PV equals NRT. It doesn't have to be that way, right? We could rearrange it as we need, but if we look at our selections here, uh, A is exactly that expression right there. PV equals NRT. Pressure times volume equals moles times the gas constant times temperature. And the units of each one of these variables, pressure, volume, moles, temperature, is dictated by the units in this constant. This is one form of the constant. Liter atmospheres per mole. K. So that means this has to be K, that has to be moles, this has to be liters, and this has to be atmospheres to use that constant. If you have a different constant, then you use different units for your variables. All right, six. Okay, what is the volume in liters occupied by 2.12 moles of nitrogen gas at 0 0.745 atmosphere pressure and a temperature of 55 degrees? The solution to this type of problem depends on what type it is. For gases, remember we discussed two types of problems. One is before and after. If you know conditions, say before, and you know some of the conditions after with one missing, you can solve for it using the correct uh, gas law expression. But if you're in a state situation where you only know what, what are the conditions right now, that means you need to use the ideal gas equation. And that's what we have here. And when I solve these types of problems, I put the four factors up here. Moles, pressure, volume, temperature. And I extract from the problem that information. 2.12 moles. Okay. How about pressure? 0 0.745 atmospheres. Okay. How about volume? That's the question. We don't know. That's the unknown. And temperature. 55 degrees C. Now we know we're gonna to have to convert this, so we might as well add 273 to it and determine what the K temperature is, right? So that'd be eight and 12 and three, 328K. Now we use the same formula, PV equals NRT. And why don't we go ahead and solve this equation for the volume? That's what we're gonna need. So volume equals NRT over P. Right, so now we can put the moles in. I'm gonna leave the units out just for safe space. Um, gas constant and temperature divided by pressure. 0 0.745 atmospheres. Now I'm gonna go ahead and calculate this one because sometimes my answer keys are wrong. So I check them every now and then just to be sure. 2.12.08206 times 3.8 times 0.745 divided. So I get, let's see, well that's two. Two significant figures. Looks like their answers are in three significant figures, so I'm going to round to three. 76.6. Volume, 76.6 liters. That's C. All right. Number seven. 
the partial pressure of helium in a gaseous mixture of helium and nitrogen trifluoride is a uh, definition of the partial pressure. What is the partial pressure? Well, if we have a total pressure, John Dalton said that the total pressure is an arithmetic sum of the individual pressures of the gases contained. So we've got uh, helium and nitrogen trifluoride. So you got pressure for helium and you got pressure for nitrogen trifluoride. Right. So how do we state that in words? Well, A says the pressure that helium would exert in the absence of nitrogen trifluoride. That's exactly right. The pressure of each of the gases in the absence of all the others is the partial pressure of that gas. So we found our answer. How about eight? Nope. Skip eight. Go to nine. There we go. Number nine. Which of the following is not a factor in determining the magnitude of the vapor pressure of a liquid? Not a factor. So, uh, is, is the temperature a factor in determining the vapor pressure? Yeah, definitely. Right. You get those molecules moving faster, there's more of them going into the vapor phase. The strength of the attractive forces between molecules? Yes. The intermolecular forces are different for different gases. I think the example we used was um, ethanol and diethyl ether. They both have the same um, formula, but they have different structures. One of them is has a um, the ability to hydrogen bond with its neighbors and the other one doesn't. So that bonding determines uh, how loosely the uh, molecules interact. So that one's, that one's good. How about C? The size of the container for the liquid. <laughs> the volume of the container. Nope, does not matter. And D, the type of forces between molecules within the liquids. That's the same as this one. So C is the one that doesn't fit. C is false. How about 10? All right, a liquid is placed in a closed container. Equilibrium is reached when? So we got a liquid in a closed container. Let's draw a flask here and put a stopper in it. Okay, got a liquid. And what's the liquid gonna do? Well, it's gonna vaporize. Some of it is gonna go into the vapor phase. Okay. Until you get enough up here in the vapor phase, they start returning. And the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. That's when it stops moving uh, macroscopically. We don't see the level of the liquid change anymore. But they're still happening. Evaporation, condensation happening uh, at a furious rate. So let's see, what does that have to do with number 10? Equilibrium is reached when? When all the liquid evaporates? No, not every time. In fact, if all the liquid evaporates, then there's no equilibrium. You just got, you got to have two phases to have equilibrium. So A didn't work. When the rate of condensation equals the rate of evaporation, bingo, that's the one. How about 11? 
liquids will boil at lower temperature at higher elevations because they're stating this as a fact. A liquid will boil at a lower temperature when it goes to a higher elevation. Right. So if we say the boiling point of water at sea level sea level, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees. Okay. If we take it to um, I'm not sure what the height of Mount Everest is now. Used to be uh, 29,028 feet. If you take it to that height, now what's the boiling point going to be? I think the last time I looked, it was in the neighborhood of 78 degrees Celsius. Okay, so the boiling point goes down with elevation. Why is that? Well, let's see. The intermolecular attractions are weaker? No. Water is water. Atmospheric pressure increases. No. <laughs> As you go higher, atmospheric pressure decreases. Uh, C, it is harder to transfer heat to the liquid. That's not the reason. It might be harder, but that's not the reason it has a lower boiling point. The vapor pressure at which boiling occurs is lower. Right? When is the boiling point? What, under what conditions do we establish boiling point? When the vapor pressure inside the liquid is equal to the vapor pressure outside the liquid. So we increase the vapor pressure inside the liquid by heating it. And if the vapor pressure outside the liquid is lower, then you don't have to get it as hot to make the two balance. And then the water starts boiling. So D is the answer. That's the key to a change in boiling point with elevation. Number 12. Which of the following statements about intermolecular forces is incorrect? Intermolecular, the forces between molecules. Uh, a, they must be overcome in order for the molecules to escape from the liquid state into the vapor state. Is that true? Yes, it is. A is true. They are much weaker than intramolecular forces, the forces that hold the molecule together. Is that true? Yes. How do we know? We know that the forces holding molecules together is much stronger than the forces between molecules. Otherwise, if the forces between molecules were stronger than the ones holding the molecule together, they just rip the molecule apart. It's right? simple as that. So yeah, B statement is true. How about C? They are electrostatic in origin. Yes. The attraction between molecules, as we understand it now, is electrostatic. Um, if they are polar, that's a fairly strong interaction as, as intermolecular forces go. So we have polar molecules like water, right? And the bond is polar this way and this way. So overall, the polarity goes that way. So this end is going to be slightly negative and this end is going to be slightly positive. And then you get those uh, negatives and positives lining up in water so that they hold one another together in the liquid phase at room temperature. So yeah, C is true. How about D? We have a process of elimination. We expect D to be the bad one. They occur within molecules rather than between, right? That's just the opposite. So the way around, intramolecular forces are inside the molecules, intermolecular forces are between the molecules. So this one is the false one.
All right, that was 12. How about 13? 13. In which of the following liquids would London forces be the predominant intermolecular forces? All right. First of all, you remember what London forces are. London dispersion forces. Well, first of all, they are very weak. Second of all, they are temporary. Okay? So they come and go. So a combination of these two means that if you have a, a polar molecule, now we're talking about London forces being predominant, right? These are predominant. In which one of those selections? Remember that London forces are always happening. They're always there for every molecule. But they're so weak and temporary that other forces can overwhelm them and they become insignificant. So what we need to do is find a molecule where those stronger forces are not there anymore, like uh, ionic attractions, uh, polar attractions. If those are missing, then the London dispersion forces become dominant, right? HCN, how about that one? Hey. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> Come on. Don't forget to sign in. Gotcha. Okay, so we're on 13. We're trying to figure out which one of these molecules is uh, uh, the predominant forces holding them together are London forces. London forces are very weak and they're temporary, so, and they're always there. I should put that down here too always present. So they're only, they're only predominant forces when the other stronger forces are absent. The polar forces, the ionic bonding, whatever those happen to be. Um, this molecule, hydrogen cyanide, is polar. It has a polarity going like that. So that one won't work. How about B? The thing to notice here is that these two nitrogen atoms are bonded together. They're equivalent in the way they attract molecules, uh, electrons to themselves. So this is nonpolar. This is the best candidate for London dispersion forces. We could go through the others like um, um, hydrogen sulfide, right? It's polar. Looks like water, except it's got sulfur there. And then D is iodine and fluorine, All right? So we're gonna get polarity that direction because fluorine is, is a stronger attractant than iodine. So the best one is B, dinitrogen gas. That's where London dispersion forces are the only thing it has access to. That's why nitrogen uh, only turns into a liquid uh, at the coldest temperature of all of these minus 195 degrees Celsius, it will liquefy because of these forces. But these other guys, they turn liquid at a lot higher temperature. This ratio is not doing as well as I thought it would. Sad thing is I got a whole box full of now I have to use them. <laughs> okay, 14. Which of the following descriptions apply to matter in the solid state? Okay, if you got a solid, it's going to have what? Fixed volume and fixed shape. Both. So, 
Uh, definite shape and high density is, is A. Okay, so A is true, right? A is a good one. How about B? Cohesive forces dominate over disruptive. Uh-huh, that's true. Remember our discussion of cohesive and disruptive forces? Not now, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, in solids, the cohesive dominate. In liquids, they're about balanced. And in gases, the disruptive dominant. Mm -hmm. So A and B are both true. Let's see it. How about C? Kinetic energy dominates over potential energy. No. That one's not true. More than one correct response? Well, yeah. That one is true. <laughs> okay. So D is the answer to this one. This is one of those where you have to go through every possibility to find the answer because of those oddballs, more than one, two of the above, no, none correct, that kind of thing. That forces you to look at every one of them. 15. Which of the following samples of gas would have a new volume of three liters if the pressure is decreased from three atmospheres to one atmosphere at constant temperature. So what are we talking about here? There's pressure and there's volume. Now we're talking about Boyle's law, right? Pressure times volume is a constant. But is this a state situation or is this a before and after? Well, we've got, um, two pressures in there and one volume. So I think it's a before and after. All right, so we have P1, V1 equals P2, V2. What we have to do is, is decide which one goes where. Let's do it this way. V1, P2, V2. I do it this way because if you get confused, extracting information from the problem, you could put it in the, in the formula in the wrong place. And of course, then you end up with the wrong answer. So which of the following samples of gas would have a new volume, a new volume of three liters, a new volume of three liters. That's the second, that's a new volume. If the pressure is decreased from three atmospheres, That's water dripping on the hot plate. <laughs> From three atmospheres to one atmosphere. So this is the final. Okay. This is the one that's unknown. So if we plug the values in here, uh, let's solve for the unknown. V1 equals P2, V2 over P1. So now we can put P2 in here as one, and V2 is three, and P1 is three. So these cancel. The original volume is one liter. So which one of these supplies one liter? A is the only one, one liter of helium. Remember, a, as far as the gas laws are concerned, a gas is a gas is a gas. Doesn't matter what it is. They all behave alike. So one liter of gas, whatever it is, is A. That one satisfies the conditions of the problem. All right, that was 15. 16. 16. Which of the following is a correct equation for the combined gas law? Okay. The, the authors who, the authors who created this uh, problem are considering the gas law, combined gas law is only pressure, volume, and temperature. What I showed you in class included moles, but there are no moles here. So we just stick to pressure, volume, and temperature. So the combined gas law would be uh, P1, V1 over T1, right? This is Boyle's law. This is Charles' law. And that's equal to P2, 
V2 over T2. But they, they might be rearranged. It looks like they're solved for uh, pressure, volume, and temperature. So P2 here. Now we put volume over here, temperature over there. So we have P1V1 times T2 over T1. Oops, not T2, P2. That one's over there. Um, V2. Okay. Uh, all right, so that one's not right because it's got a T1 up here. So A is wrong. How about B? Solve for, for a volume. V2. Okay, V2 means that T2 goes up here again, but in this case, P2 goes down here. Yeah, okay, so that's uh, V1, P2, T2 on top. Nope, that one's wrong. How about C, solve for T2? All right, so we get T2 over here, and so we bring T2 over here. I'm gonna erase all of it. We bring T2 over here. That means T1, P2, V2 goes over there. And these two come over here. There. So T1, P2, V. Nope. C is wrong also. Okay, so there are no correct answers. Right, they're all wrong. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You have to solve each one individually for the the uh, unknown that's in the problem before you can answer that question. So that you have to scratch your brain for days in algebra class, solving for unknowns. Seventeen. You have had algebra, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to be sure because yeah. some of my students are either haven't had it or are in it now, which is probably good because it's fresh. Yeah. When the vapor pressure of a liquid equals atmospheric pressure, the temperature of the liquid equals 100 degrees if the liquid's at sea level. A, no. That's only if it's water. How about uh, B, the boiling point of the liquid. When the vapor pressure of the liquid equals atmospheric pressure, the temperature of the liquid equals. Okay. Here's the case where we have to pick uh, either the best answer. All right. I know why I put this one in here because it's confusing. The boiling point of the liquid uh, is true. But if we're at um, you know what? I think B would be a better answer. The normal boiling point of the liquid is at one atmosphere pressure. Yeah, that one needs that one needs some editing. Seventeen. Seventeen should be. Either change the wording of the question or change the answer. The way it's worded, um, the nor the uh, B would be a better answer. It's only normal boiling point when you're at one atmosphere pressure. Yeah. And if you give, if I put a question like that on a test and you give the answer that we just discussed. And I mark it wrong. Tell me about it, because you deserve the points. Yeah, yeah. Stand up for yourself. Eighteen. Intermolecular forces differ from intramolecular forces in that what? Well, intermolecular forces are between molecules. 
Intramolecular are the forces that hold the molecule together. They're the actual bonds between atoms. Okay, so um, they differ, the intermolecular differ from the intra in that they occur only in liquids? No, they occur everywhere. They're much stronger? No, they're much weaker. Right? Intermolecular forces have to be weaker. If they were stronger than intramolecular forces, they'd rip the molecule apart. Uh, C, they occur only when hydrogen atoms are present. <laughs> no, I don't think so. They occur all the time. No correct response. That's the one for number 18. Number 19. In which of the following pairs of molecules would the first listed member of the pair have a higher boiling point than the second listed member? So what we're looking for here is which one has the stronger forces, intermolecular forces, HF or HBr. All right, so here, HF versus HBr. Did we talk about um, just flew out of my head? Um, I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, the gist of this one is that fluorine has a stronger attraction for electrons than bromine does. So the, um, the polarity of this molecule is higher than that one. Higher polarity means uh, a stronger electrostatic charge uh, uh, attraction between molecules. So this one would have a higher boiling point. So A is the answer. Well, more than one correct. Okay, so we have to do all of them. So this one's correct. That one's higher than the second one. Uh, F2 and Cl2. F2. And Cl2. Okay. The thing about these is um, that's that one. This is that one. They are nonpolar. Right. So you can't blame intermolecular attractions and boiling point on polarity. The only thing you have to work with with these is London dispersion forces. So London dispersions are going to be higher for this one because this is a bigger molecule. And the size of the molecule matters because you have more room for the electrons to shift around. And London dispersion forces are temporary, so they have more places to go, higher probability of being someplace they're not supposed to be at any given time. So the larger the molecule has the higher London dispersions. This one will have a higher boiling point. So um, B is false. How about C? O2 and NO. O2 and NO. All right, NO is, let's see, like that, I think, 246, 8, 246, 8. No, I think it's got three bonds. That won't work. It has to be two. Sorry. Uh, but this is polar, and that's not polar. So this one's going to have a higher boiling point. All right. So that means uh, more than one's not correct, none are correct. A is the only one. That's your answer. Electronegativity it just came to me. Did we talk about electronegativity? Yeah, we, yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. Right, and it goes, the trend in the periodic table is electronegativity increases from lower left to upper right. So fluorine has the highest electronegativity in the entire table. Noble gases don't count. Right? They're happy. They don't care about what everybody else is doing. Uh, okay, so we got one of these. 20. All right, so we got to look at uh, number one, two, and three and see which ones of these are true. So number one 
is number one true. Sublimation and deposition are opposite changes of state. What's sublimation? Sublimation is going from solid to gas. Right? That's sublimation. What's the opposite of that? Deposition. Right? So one is true. Right? One is true. How about two? A pressure of one atmosphere is greater in magnitude than a pressure of 720 torr. Remember, 720 torr is the same as 720 millimeters of mercury. So one atmosphere being 760 millimeters of mercury is bigger. Right? So pressure of one atmosphere is larger. Right? So that was true. How about three, the boiling point of a liquid can be increased by heating the liquid to a higher temperature. No, the boiling point is dependent upon the nature of the liquid. It's the intermolecular forces that matter. That's the only way you can change it is to change those forces, right? So only one and two are true. So that would be B, two of the three statements are true. I got a student, is it in this class? Yeah, I think it's in this class. Who likes these things? <laughs> Says it makes her think. That's good. <laughs> That's what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen her in a while. I hope she's all right. Oh, no, you know, I remember who uh -huh. <laughs> I remember that. 21. Um, associated with Charles' law is the concept that if a temperature of the gas increases, the volume of the gas also increases. Temperature, volume, both increase at the same time? Yep, that's true. That's Charles' law. Liquids show little change in volume with changes in temperature. That's true. They do change a little bit, but not much. And three, dipole-dipole interactions. That is two polar molecules aligning with their partial charges, negative to positive, uh, are examples of intramolecular forces. No, we can stop right there. Dipole-dipole is an intermolecular, just like hydrogen bond. So three is false. Uh, that means uh, B is the best answer. Only two of them are true. There's another one. 22. Um, one, both dipole-dipole interactions and hydrogen bonds are stronger than most single covalent bonds. Is that true? No, no. These intermolecular forces have to be less than the intra. So that makes that one false. The value of the ideal gas constant is the same for all gases under ordinary conditions of pressure, volume, and temperature. Ideal gas constant is the same. Yes, that's why it's a constant, because it doesn't change. Right? So two's right. Both condensation and freezing are endothermic changes of state. Condensation goes from gas to a liquid. And freezing goes from a liquid to a solid. Okay. Is that endothermic from gas to a liquid? No. When you go from high energy to low energy, you gotta give up energy. It's exothermic, right? Both of these are exo. All right, so that was false. Only one is true. C. Let me see here. Uh, there's another one. Okay. Hey. 
25, 25. Um, one, <clears throat> water's boiling point. Water's boiling point is much lower than expected. Boiling point lower than expected. We can stop there. Water's boiling point is higher than expected. If water were in the same trend as um, other analogs, say um, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, all those dihydrides, oxygen, uh, sulfur, yeah, sulfur, selenium, dihydrides, these have very low boiling points. This one has a very high boiling point. Compared to these, we would think the, uh, the boiling point here would be a lot lower than it is. But we, this is hydrogen bonded. This is a very electronegative atom. These are not. So they, they produce very polar bonds. So water boils at 100 degrees instead of like 10 degrees, which is good for us. Uh, because otherwise there wouldn't be no liquid water on the surface of the earth. We would be in big trouble. So one is false. Right? It's, it's the other way around. Boiling point of water is actually higher than expected. In the gaseous state, disruptive forces and cohesive forces are about the same magnitude. Nope. That's liquids. Liquids, they're about equal, about three. Uh, as liquid surface area increases, the rate of evaporation of a liquid increases. Um, that's true, but now we got a because. Is the because correct? Because molecules encounter less external pressure. No. They were doing good for a while until they said because, and then that messed everything up. Why is it? The rate of evaporation of liquid increases with surface area simply because there's more, there are more atoms or molecules at the surface escaping. It's simple as that, right? So this is uh, D, none of the statements are true. Uh, temptation there is to overthink it. That's what they're counting on when they give you those squirrely answers. 26. For each of the physical state characterizations, select from the response list the physical state or states to which the characterization apply. Oh, okay. Indefinite shape. It cannot maintain its own shape, so it needs a vessel to hold it. That's true for which ones? Not solids. Liquids, yeah. And gases. Right, liquids and gases, both liquids and gases and liquid states. That's D. D is the description of uh, indefinite shape. How about 28? Ah. Do the whole thing. 28. For each of the physical state characters, okay, we've already read that part. Potential energy dominates over kinetic energy. Potential energy. Cohesive forces dominate over disruptive forces. That's a solid. Yeah, solid only. So that's B. B, solid state only. All right, 29. Um, okay, I don't need to reread the question. Particles are relatively close together. What state is characterized by that? Well, solids, definitely. 
but they're pretty close together for liquids too. Right? So liquids and solids are um, a fair choice for that one. All right, 30. Consider the mathematical expression for gas laws listed. Select the correct name for the law from the response list. Uh, P1, B1 equals P2B2. Who's that? You know. Boil. Boil is pressure volume. Yeah. Boil is pressure volume. I didn't write the number up there, but that's all right. Okay, you get another chance. How about this one? V1 over T1 equals V2 divided by T2. Volume temperature. Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> that would be Charles. Yep. Um, we don't need that one. 34. <clears throat> Uh, select the name of the change of state for which energy is absorbed. So energy is absorbed. Let's see. When you go from uh, solid to liquid, you have to absorb energy. And when you go from liquid to gas, you have to absorb energy. Or when you go from straight from solid to gas, you have to absorb energy. So what's this one called? Solid to liquid is melting. Uh, liquid to gas is evaporation, and solid to gas is uh, sublimation. Okay, what do we got here? Condensation is not there, deposition is not there, freezing is not there, sublimation is there. So A is the answer. You have to add energy. Endothermic process. Pictures help. I can draw pictures. I learned that in kindergarten. That's 65 years ago. Characterize the effect that changes will have on the vapor pressure and boiling point of a liquid by decreasing the temperature of the liquid from 20 liquid by 20 degrees at constant pressure. So we're going to change the temperature by 20 degrees. It's going to decrease the temperature by 20 degrees, and the pressure is constant. Okay. 30 pressure and boiling point. Okay. So if we decrease the temperature, um, does the vapor pressure change? Vapor pressure. How does the vapor pressure change when we decrease the temperature? It also decreases, right? Vapor pressure decreases. How about uh, boiling point? Does the boiling point change when we change the temperature? Nope. No change. So that's B. Vapor pressure decreases, boiling point doesn't change. Let's see here. How are we doing on time? Okay, we've got another hour. And we're only up to 38. Check this out. Oh, okay. We're moving along. That's good. 38. For the following intermolecular force descriptions, select the correct name from the response list permanent right if the elect if the permanent is the permanent electrostatic interactions between polar molecules in which no hydrogen is present so that means london forces are out they're not permanent right? so a's out hydrogen bonding hydrogen bonding is out because it says in which no hydrogen is present 
covalent bonding. Covalent's not an intermolecular force. It's an intramolecular force. So by process of elimination, it has to be D, dipole-dipole interaction. Okay. All right. How about, if I get both of these on here, it's that one time. 40. I must have spliced these together. Put both chapters together. Okay. A solution may contain what? When you make a solution, you've got one solid. One solid. And many solutes are possible you can have only one solute but you can have as many as you want actually only one solvent and many solutes that looks like a All right a is true okay Forty-one, I think. Which of the following statements concerning a saturated solution is incorrect? Saturated solution. What does that mean? That means it, it's got all the solute they can hold. Right? It can't hold anymore. So, uh, A, undissolved solute must be present. Oh, we're looking for the incorrect one. Right. Uh, no, it can be it can be saturated without any undissolved solvent. Right. So that's false. Lots of times you will have undissolved sol uh, solute, but not necessarily. B. Undissolved solute may or may not be present. Yeah, B is true. Well, we found the wrong one. Right. So we could go through the rest of them or just be happy with that answer. Now, when you're making a saturated solution, um, you go to your reference manual and you find out at, at what temperature it's listed, how much of uh, the solute will go into solution at that temperature, right? and you measure out that plus a little extra. And then you, you throw it in the right volume and mix it up and wait or the other thing you can do is heat it up usually heating it will make it uh, dissolve more and then let it cool down and as it cools down most solutions will expel the extra that it doesn't need for saturation and then if you don't want any of that uh, solid floating around you just filter the solution and from that point on, it's saturated with no uh, precipitate in the bottom. That's not the proper word. Precipitate comes from a chemical reaction. No solid left over. 43. For which of the following types of ionic compounds are most examples insoluble in water? Okay. So this one, you either know the rules or you go look at the um, at the chart right, with the clear squares and the grayed out squares. You remember that one? Yeah. Or do you need a copy of it? I didn't put that one out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me see if I can find a copy of that. Only if I mix solubility. Here we go. So this has both the, uh, the chart and the rules at the bottom. And I've already told you guys, you don't have to memorize the rules unless you really want to. Okay. But the chart is based upon those rules. So, um, insoluble. All nitrates are soluble. I think that's rule number one or two. All nitrates are soluble, right? So, uh, well, I, I should not check. I should say that 
because we're looking for the insoluble one. Sulfates. Most sulfates are soluble. Hydroxides. Most hydroxides are insoluble. Unless they're hydroxides of alkali metals like sodium, potassium. Right. Remember the way those those um, rules are ordered. The one above takes precedence. So if you've got a compound with sodium or potassium in it, it's rule one or two, and you come down to hydroxides, it says they're not soluble. Then the one above wins. And most chlorides are soluble also. So the hydroxides are the ones. See, the hydroxides are the one that are most of the examples are insoluble. Forty-five. Looks like we got a problem to solve here. What is the molarity of a solution containing sixteen point seven grams of ammonia? Grams of ammonia. Okay. In one point five liters of solution. In one point five liters. Okay. Um. And we're looking for molarity, which means what? Molarity equals moles per volume, and volume has to be in liters. Okay, we've already got liters. That's good. What we need here is moles. So remember how to get moles out of grams? Need molar mass. So we need 14.01 for nitrogen, and then 3 times 1.01 for hydrogens. So that's 4 there, 17. 17.04. So we take 16.7 grams, I right, got a conversion factor with grams on the bottom, moles on the top, so that the grams cancel. And the grams goes down here like that, like that. So we divide 1704 into 16.7. 0 0.90. 980. Yeah, 980 moles. Now we can fill it in here. 0 0.98. Yeah, three significant figures. But the volume is only two. So divide that by 1.5. And that's 0 0.65. 0 0.65. Can't write. Molar. Uh, best one of those would be B. Uh, they carried it out to three significant figures. No, that's right. Six, five. Yeah, six, five, three. I left my zero off here. There we go. So if they were right, now I was wrong. There we go. We get 46 and 47 at the same time. Forty-six. If 145 milliliters of two molar KOH is diluted to 1.15 liters, the resulting solution contains how many moles of KOH? All right. Um, this one, <laughs> this one is blowing some blue smoke in your face. If it says how many moles of KOH? do you have in the resulting solution, you're taking a two molar KOH solution. How many zeros? Two. Two molar KOH solution. And you're taking 145 milliliters of it. Right? Molarity times volume equals moles. Well, in this case, millimoles. Unless you want if we convert this to liters, how, how many liters is 145 milliliters? One, two, three, zero point one four five liters. So if you multiply molarity times volume, remember M equals uh, moles per volume. 
So the number of moles equals molarity times volume. So molarity times volume equals the number of moles that you're pulling out of that solution with this volume. So that'd be uh, uh, 0 0.29. Is that right? Moles. Yeah. Oh, K-O-H. That's how many moles you got. It doesn't matter how much you dilute it when you're talking about absolute numbers of moles. If the problem had said, what's the concentration of the new solution? Yeah. Then you would divide this by the new volume. But it just says you stop at the number of moles. Right? So diluted to 1.15 liters is irrelevant. The answer is A, 0.29 moles. Uh, 47. All right. A colloidal dispersion differs from a suspension in that colloidal particles what? <clears throat> we talk about solutions and suspensions. The major difference between a solution and a suspension is the suspension will settle out over time. But a colloid is in between. A colloid is not a solution, but it's a special kind of suspension where the particles are so small that the kinetic energy of the solvent, actually I can't say solvent, the kinetic energy of the dispersing medium is sufficient to keep the colloidal particles suspended indefinitely. So with that knowledge, which one of these is correct? The colloidal, uh, differs from the suspension in that colloidal particles tend to settle at an appreciable rate. No, they don't. They don't settle at all. B, are large enough to scatter light. That's true. B is true. That's the Tyndall effect. They scatter light, whereas a solution will not. Um, C, are large enough to be seen with a naked eye? No. Are large enough to be seen with a microscope? No. So the best answer there is B. They're large enough to scatter light. But actually, I would, the question should be, it would be a better question if we would say a colloidal dispersion differs from a solution in that the colloidal particles are large enough to scatter light that would be a better question but as it is uh b is the best answer for that one out of those that were given Compared to pure water, a one molar sugar water solution will have what? One molar sucrose. We'll have what? Uh, it looks like we're talking about um, colligative properties here. Compared to water, it'll have a lower vapor pressure. That's true. So A, uh, a lower vapor pressure is true. How about the second one? Lower boiling point. Lower boiling point? No. Higher boiling point. All right, so A can't be it. How about B? Higher vapor pressure? Nope. <laughs> you can throw that one out. How about C? Lower vapor pressure? Okay, lower vapor pressure, that's true. How about the second one? Higher boiling point? Yes. Higher boiling point. And we got a third one in there. Lower freezing point? Yes. All three. C is correct. Okay. Those are all colligative properties. Remember what a colligative property is? 
is a property of a solution which varies with the amount of the solute only. It doesn't matter what solute it is. It only varies with the amount. So you don't even have to know what the solute is. And that's good because we use colligative properties to determine molar mass of compounds when we don't know what the compound, what the structure, what the uh, molecular formula is. Remember when we were doing um, 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 empirical formulas and then we moved from empirical to molecular? We needed to know what's the molar mass of that compound. These colligative properties are some of the ways that you can determine that molar mass without knowing anything about the compound. So we're going to do that today. We're going to determine the um, molar mass of benzoic acid using freezing point depression. Okay, 49. Uh, what's the freezing point for a solution containing one mole of sodium chloride? So we got one mole of sodium chloride dissolved in one kilogram of water. One kilogram of water. It doesn't give us any more information. We can't determine the freezing point without. Okay, that's a bad question. You need information. What's the formula that we use? Change in temperature. And this is, we're looking for a freezing point, freezing point depression. So the freezing point changes by that much based upon the um, freezing point depression constant for water times the molality times the Van Hoff correction factor. All right. We are not given the K value. Actually, the K value is 1.86 um, degrees C per uh, molal. Okay, so what's the molality here? How do you calculate molality? Well, it's the moles of the solute divided by the kilograms of the solvent. So this is one molal. Okay, and what's the correction factor? Correction factor is two, because when this goes into solution, it breaks up into one sodium and one chloride. That's two ions. Remember that? Vaguely. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now that we know that information, we can say that the freezing point is going to be depressed by two times one point eight six or three point seven two, right? Degree C. Or D. D is the answer. That problem should have more information buried in the question because you can't solve it with just that as written. Or you need um, a chart with useful information in it. So if you come across a problem like this, well, if you take the test in the classroom, um, then you can ask me for that information. Number 50. All right. Crenation of red blood cells occurs when cells are placed in what? What's crenation? Our blood cell is going to be circular. Crenation is going to be. It, sh it shrinks. So the cell membrane crinkles. All right. So what happens there? Well, in order for that to happen, water migrates out of the cell into the solution. So why would that happen? The solution surrounding the cell must be hypertonic. It must have a higher salt content or higher dissolved solute content than inside the cell. So the water moves through the membrane out of the cell. So hypertonic solution C 
uh, answers that question. If you put the cell in a hypotonic solution, what will happen? Eventually, it'll explode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cell death. <laughs> it, the proper term is it, it lyses. That's a, that's a Greek word for cut. It breaks apart. 51. Okay, which of the following solutions is hypertonic with respect to blood? Okay, um, we got choices in here with sodium chloride and glucose. So we need to look at, at both, start from an isotonic uh, concentration and then work your way to hypertonic. So for sodium chloride, 0.9% is isotonic, sodium chloride, okay? Um, and uh, D5W, or 5% dextrose, 5% sugar, is isotonic. So which one of those is hyper, or higher concentration than this? 0 0.5, 0 0.7 sodium chloride, no, nope, neither one of those. 4.5, 7.6. So D is hypertonic. Every EMT knows D5W. Dextrose, 5% by weight. 52. Which of the following statements about solutions is correct? A solution is a homogeneous mixture. Is that true? Yes, indeed it is. Uh, B, it is possible to have a solution in which both solute and solvent are solids. That's true also. Think of brass, nickel and copper. That's a solid solution. Uh, C, solutions readily separate into solute and solvent if left undisturbed for 24 hours. That is false. They never separate. That's definition for a solution. So D, more than one correct response? Yeah. D is the correct answer. All right. 53. A crystal of solid sodium chloride is placed in an aqueous sodium chloride solution. Okay, so we got sodium chloride in solution, and then we put a cube of sodium chloride in there. All right, so now what do we got? Let's see. Uh, it is observed that most, but not all, of the crystal dissolves. So it's going into solution. This means the original solution was what? Well, it wasn't supersaturated. It wasn't saturated right? because you can get more of it into solution. So it must be unsaturated. But was it dilute? We don't know. There's no way to tell. We're not given enough information to say it's dilute. Uh, oh, yes, we are. Because not all of it dissolves. So it reaches saturation before all of it is gone. That means that it's not dilute. If it were dilute, all of that cube would be gone. All right, so that gives us clues that tells us that B is right, but C is not. So B is the correct answer. It's unsaturated. That's all we can say about it. Okay, 54. No time. Okay, I think we can get it. Consider the following substances and their polarities. A is polar. A is polar, 
V is polar. C is nonpolar. And D is nonpolar. Okay. It is true that what? A is more soluble in C than in B. Nope. That's wrong. A is more soluble in B than it is in C because like dissolves like. How about C is more soluble in D than it is in A? Yes, that's true. B is true. Uh, okay, we got some screwballs, D and E. So we got to look at C. How about C? D is more soluble in B than C. Nope, that's false. It's all based upon like dissolves like. So the only correct answer here is B. Fifty-five. In which of the following sets of ionic compounds are all members of the set insoluble in water? Okay. So we got to look at all of them because of D and E. How about silver chloride? Right. Is it soluble in water? Nope, that's a solid. How about lead to chloride? Nope, that's soluble. That's a solid. How about ammonium chloride? All ammonia salts, ammonium salts are soluble. So that's aqueous. So B won't be it. They have to all be insoluble. How about B? Copper carbonate. Copper two carbonate is a solid. Right. Most carbonates are insoluble. All right. We have calcium carbonate, solid. Magnesium carbonate, solid. Yeah, B's, B's a good answer. So we have to look at C, just to be sure. Lead to sulfate is a solid. Uh, and you can check me on that chart to be sure I'm not lying to you. Oh, yeah, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Iron two sulfate. I think this one is is soluble. Check me on that. Iron two plus and sulfate. Cations across the top, anions down the left hand side. Yeah. Uh, it is soluble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, good. Okay. Good. Uh, and I know barium sulfate is insoluble. Okay. How do I know that? Because they use that for barium enemas and barium swallows. And they do it because it's not soluble. Barium is a huge atom and it attenuates x rays very efficiently. So they make you swallow it and that brings out the definition of your gut. Either the upper end or the lower end. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's not dissolved. It doesn't absorb into your body because it's insoluble. Uh, so it's safe to, to uh, swallow that. Okay, so B was the B was the right one, the 55. And 61 and 62, let's see. Yeah, I can get them both on there. And I'll be getting close to the bottom. Which of the following solutions has an osmolarity of three? 3.0 osmol. It doesn't have a single letter abbreviation. You have to say osmol. Um, so which would be three osmol? Well, what you need is a molarity. Um, the possibilities are three molar of uh, non dissociated, like uh, sucrose, uh, something that doesn't break apart when you put it in solution. Or you could have um, a 1.5 molar 
sodium fluoride or some ionic compound that breaks into two. So two times this would be three. Right? We don't have that. Right? We have sodium chloride, two molar sodium chloride would be four osmole. Um, four molar glucose would be four osmole. Uh, one molar sodium phosphate. Right? That would be one, two, three, four. Four osmole. So none of them are correct. They're all wrong. All right, 62. Yeah, 62. Uh, in which of the following pairings are the terms closely related? All right, A. Hemo excuse me, hemolysis, that is rupturing blood cells, and hypoto hypotonic. Yeah, A is true. When you have a hypotonic solution, water is moving into the cell, causes it to explode. That's hemolysis. So A is true. How about B? Uh, hypertonic, higher osmotic pressure than within the cell. Yeah. B is true. How about C? Isotonic solution and crenation. Nope. Isotonic is perfect. The cell is going to be perfectly happy in that solution as long as it lives. So two of the above are correct, more than one, that's D. D is the correct answer for that. Or if you thought that um, C was correct, A, B, and C are correct, then you could do D and get the right answer for the wrong reasons. <laughs> that's the danger of that type of question. Okay, 63. All right, we've got to find out which ones of these are true. Equal volumes of two solutions of the same molarity contain the same number of grams of solute. Is that true? Yes. Partial. No. No, yeah, that's not. What do they have the same number of? Moles. Yeah. yeah, molarity. If they have the same volume, they got the same number of moles, but they don't necessarily have the same number of grams. Right, so that one's right. Hemolysis and crenation are opposite processes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the solubility rule, like dissolves like, is not adequate for predicting the solubility of ionic compounds in water. You can predict some, but not all. Some of them don't behave. Yeah. Okay. So this one, that one has to be false. So I would say that only one of them is true. That one's missing. 63. Let me see if it's on the hard copy. My hard copy. Yeah, it should be C. Yeah, that's right. We we reasoned that one correctly. All right. 65. I'm going to run down to the wire. Um, number one, addition of 40 milliliters of water to 10 milliliters of 8 molar sodium hydroxide would produce a 2 molar sodium hydroxide solution. Okay, this is a dilution problem. So we'd say uh, molarity uh, concentrated, volume concentrated equals molarity dilute, volume dilute. So which one's the concentrated volume? 8 molar, right? And what's the volume 10 milliliters of that volume okay what's the molarity of the final solution well it's supposed to be two molar 
and that's from adding 40 milliliters. So what's the final volume? 10 plus 40, right? 50 milliliters. But the mistake there is to assume that it's 40 and not. You discount the 10 milliliters that all we were, was already there. All right, so this is 2 times 50 is 100. 8 times 10 is 80. So 80 is not equal to 100. All right, so 1 is false. 2. Henry's law is a pressure solubility relationship for gases and liquids. Yes. The concentration of the gas in solution is dependent upon the pressure. So we would say concentration equals whatever Henry's constant is times pressure. So two is true. Right. How about three? Boiling points are the basis for the solubility rule like dissolved like. Boiling points. No. Like dissolved like are based is based upon polarity. I guess you could stretch that. Boiling points are also based upon intermolecular forces. But no, because the boiling point also depends upon external pressure. All right, so three is out also. Right, we can't do three. Right, there's only one right answer there. Sixty six. Okay. Uh, number one, two liters of six molar solution would contain 12 moles of solute, independent of the identity of the solute. Okay, remember, moles equals molarity times volume. So if we had uh, two liters times six, two times six equals 12 moles. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Got that one. About two, for liquid liquid solutions, volume of the solution is always greater than the sum of the volumes of the solute solvent because of solvent solvent repulsion effects. No, you can't tell. Sometimes the volume is less, sometimes the volume is more. And it doesn't matter what the reason is. About three, osmotic pressure is the amount of pressure needed to prevent the process of osmosis from occurring. Uh, yeah. That's one way of putting it. Um, the way we showed it in class was we have this tube and we have a solution here. We have, um, say, solvent in here. And we have the solution out here. And it starts off there. We have a membrane right here. And we have a uh, a hypertonic solution compared to the solvent. So, uh, no, excuse me, the other way around. Um, I'm backwards. We have the uh, hypertonic solution in here, and we have the pure solvent out here. There we go. Now the solvent, which would be water, moves in here, and it doesn't stop until it reaches a certain height where we have a pressure difference high enough to stop the thing from moving. So that's another way of saying osmotic pressure is the amount of pressure needed to prevent this process from occurring. That's true. So one and three are both true, which means B. Hmm, 67 and, yeah, squeeze 68 in there. For the set of ionic compounds, sodium nitrate, potassium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, choose the correct characterization of their solubilities in water from the response list. Those are all nitrates. All nitrates are soluble, period. Plus, 
all sodium, potassium salts, and all ammonia salts are soluble. So there's a double whammy. They're all soluble. That's A. And you can look it up in your chart to verify it. Let's see. B, uh, excuse me, that's the answer, 68. <laughs> For the set of ionic compounds, <clears throat> lithium chloride, silver chloride, and magnesium chloride, choose the correct characterization of their solubilities. So we got lithium chloride, we've got silver chloride, and we've got magnesium chloride. Now, most chlorides are soluble except for three that we've given you. Two of these are soluble. This one's not soluble. These two are soluble. So two of them are soluble. <clears throat> Let's see. Yep, there's one. 80. Using the response list, characterize the osmotic pressure of a 0.8% molar magnesium chloride. 0.8% magnesium chloride. Okay. We're comparing this to 0.9% sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Okay. So what would be the ionic concentration here? It'd be twice that, wouldn't it? So it'd be 1.8% ions. This one would be three times that. It'd be 0 0.24, uh, excuse me, 2.4. 2.4% ions. This is going to be a higher concentration or, um, well, this is isotonic. So this one would be hypertonic to cells. All right. Oh, that's it. We are done.